Hi, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Martin Gerber, and I'm working with Dr. Raphael Kleiman, uh, developing advanced characterization systems. Uh, and the technique I'm working on is involving uh, looking at how the lifetime changes with uh, temperature and also with injection level. Uh, so in doing that, I need to design a system with a large dynamic range. Uh, so I'm looking at lifetime systems and the dynamic range. And diffusion actually works to limit the dynamic range of our systems. So that's why I went into modeling it. Uh, so just to give you a brief, brief outline, I'll give you a little more of my motivation, talk about the theory, how I went through solving the equations and show you some results. Um, so as we know, uh, the lifetime's related to the photovoltaic efficiency. Um, and as I was saying, you can actually manipulate the lifetime uh, to extract information about the defects, but this requires the high dynamic range. Um, so when we think about diffusion, uh, I mean, if, if I'm using a big, broad light source, then I don't really need to think about diffusion. But if I have a pulse laser excitation, then actually all my electrons are generated in a very small region, and then they, they spread out. And so that actually can be the dominant process driving down your, uh, your carrier density. Um, so you may see your, your first decay is actually you're measuring diffusion rather than the lifetime. So that can actually screen uh, your measurement of the lifetime in the, in the early stages and reduces the dynamic range. So I became interested in you know, how much does that reduce it, because I, I wanted to pick the right laser and the right detector. Uh, to optimize this. So in terms of the theory, I want to give you uh, sort of my starting blocks, how I went through it. And then uh, this exponentially scaled uh, complementary error function, uh, it's just sort of a bit of a tangent, but it's something that gave me a bit of an issue uh, computationally. So I'd like to talk a bit about it just to give you some insight into that in case you uh, encounter it. Uh, so yeah, so I used cylindrical coordinates. Uh, I assumed perfect passivation. Uh, the, the pulse was a direct delta pulse in time and a Gaussian in the radial direction. And uh, although I was able to get uh, an exact analytical solution, the, the computation was a bit of a challenge. So I will get into that. Um, so I've mentioned the injection level. I want to clarify what that is. Uh, it's the excess carrier density divided by the equilibrium carrier density. So that's just how many carriers have I put in with my pulse of laser versus how many carriers were already there at equilibrium. Uh, and the rate, time rate of change of that parameter, the injection level, is determined by the continuity equation. So in this, I've, I've said that the time rate of change of the injection level is going to be related to the diffusive flux through the diffusivity and uh, the recombination term. So in this, uh, I'm assuming a, a constant lifetime. Uh, in reality, tau does depend on injection level, but uh, this is the first step to solving it, was to assume a constant. Uh, so before I get into the actual guts of the solution, uh, I just want to look at the general form. Um, we see that I, it does have a spatially uh, separable form. Uh, there's a radial component that depends only on rho, the radial vector, uh, a z component that comp contains only z. Uh, this is the lifetime component that we're actually trying to extract. So this needs to be the dominant, the dominant term that's actually changing over time in order to actually extract a lifetime. Uh, and what we see here is, is a ratio of the number of photons that we are putting into the system over the number of dopant atoms, or the equilibrium carrier density. So it kind of highlights that that's an important parameter, that, that ratio of the photons to equilibrium carriers. Uh, looking at the radial component, we see that it actually looks just like a Gaussian still, except that the breadth uh, evolves over time to get wider. So that makes sense with diffusion. Uh, in the z direction, we see a bit of a messier formula. But we also see uh, a, a broadening effect here. Uh, and these are the exponentially scaled error functions, complementary error functions, that I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, and I should mention that this is the alpha from the, the, the Beer's law uh, absorption coefficient. Uh, so looking more specifically at this function here, what the exponentially scaled complementary error function is, is uh, it's a e to the x squared multiplied by the complementary error function of x. So the issue with this function is that this part's blowing up to infinity, and the, the error function's going down to zero. So that's, that's all well and good. If you apply L'Hopital's rule, it, it is finite, uh, and it approaches zero as x goes to infinity. But it can be a computational problem if either this goes and overflows to infinity, or this drops to zero. You won't actually be able to calculate meaningful results. 
so my initial approach was to use arbitrary precision uh, in my simulations, but that ended up taking a very, a very long time to generate results. Uh, but I was able to actually get about 100 times faster simulations by using some approximations that were recommended by uh, Dewhurst and Shan. So if you ever end up coming against these, these types of functions, uh, you might find some value in, in that reference there. Um, so this is here a, an animation that shows uh, the evolution of the carrier density over time. Um, and so what we have in the vertical direction is the excess carrier density, uh, logarithmically displayed from around 10 to the 10 to around 6 to the 22. Um, so when we're t thinking about the injection level, we need to, we can think about the doping level as sort of a horizontal plane that we can put somewhere in this, uh, in this cube. So it depends on the doping level what the injection level actually is, but roughly speaking, the upper re region of the cube is, uh, is high level injection and low level injection in the bottom region. And uh, it's a 56 micron by 56 micron square that we're looking at in the radial row direction and Z in, in the depth direction. Uh, and we see this is basically just the boundary conditions that I've imposed, which shows Beer's law absorption in the Z direction and, and the Gaussian beam shape. Um, so can we click that? Just uh, right, right there. Oh, uh, you're not able to click the... You can't see the cursor. Okay. Uh, can we... Okay, anyway, uh, there, that does animate and it shows you this, so I'm glad I put this slide in. Um, <laughs> so this shows basically what we expect. Uh, it depends on the rela relation between the diffusivity and tau, but we see these are in 100 nanosecond chunks uh, with a tau of 100 nanoseconds. We see quickly that there's kind of this explosion effect. Uh, the, the carriers quickly diffuse outwards and then they slowly uh, exponentially recombine. Uh, so I apologize about that. And uh, what we notice, actually, if we look at the, the injection level at various positions radially at the surface, uh, is that we, we get very different results uh, if we were to measure that, the, the decay of that injection level at that position. Uh, and we see that, actually, if, as we move away from the origin, the results get worse. Um, if we look at the, the result at the origin, we see this quick diffusion uh, effect here, but then it fairly quickly uh, falls asymptotically along this line. And that's where we're going to be able to you know, just extract tau from a simple linear fit. We don't need to model diffusion or anything like that. Uh, if we're looking at these curves, it would be very hard to, to get the, uh, the lifetime without modeling diffusion. So, and we can see that the time that it takes to reach homogeneity actually gets longer and longer. So here I'm still, if I, if I tried to measure tau, I'd still get infinite. Uh, so I'm not measuring tau until much later times uh, as I move further away. Uh, so what that suggests is that we want detectors, if we really want high dynamic range, if that's the important parameter, we want detectors with smaller, uh, smaller collection volumes or smaller active areas, since they'll sample much more approximately this type of result, rather than an average effect of, of, of all of the uh, results. If I were to average those signals, I would end up with a signal that represented a lower injection level. Uh, so it's, it's basically the idea that I'm just looking for local homogeneity rather than a, a homogeneity over a larger scale. Um, and so also in, in doing that, when the nice thing about reducing the sampling volume by reducing the, the detector active area is that you can, um, you can also reduce your noise. So if I reduce the sampling volume, I reduce my signal, but fortunately I'm also reducing my noise, uh, which is related to the, the active area. So we, we're kind of minimizing the losses into the signal to noise ratio uh, as a trade-off to improve the dynamic range. Um, but yeah, so. Uh, and I'd, I'd also like to thank Manuel Gill. Uh, he provided guidance and uh, provided somebody to bounce ideas off during this experience and uh, helped me with the, the complementary error function problems that I had. Uh, so thank you for your time and I'll take any questions you may have.